I was required to summarize in a very short time the new trends and the, of the ESC recommendation. We have been working in the more recent time. And uh, my talk actually naturally follows uh, the Michael talks because uh, the first, uh, okay, the first top, the first issue is uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, as uh, already Michael pointed out, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy represent, do represent one substantial subset of the pathologic uh, causes associated with the cardiac death in uh, young individuals, uh, together with the other cardiomyopathies, mostly arrhythmogenic right, cardio, uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy, or simply arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, as now we call. And then there is also idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy, and Gerardo will have a talk about this. But, well, let's focus now on uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These are data from uh, Armon and Rezner, and the most recent data from here, from London, from Finocchiaro, they do actually confirm that hypertrophic and arrhythmogenic do represent the most, let's say, the most relevant, even if the most, not the frequent, but surely the most relevant, the most important pathological uh, abnormalities associated with the sudden cardiac death. And the mechanism explaining why hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may represent the cause for sudden death has been already explained by Michael. There is a combination of a substrate, including this array, uh, microvascular angina, the fibrosis, which in the context of exercise, which is associated with the cardiac out, myocardial oxygen supply, demand and adrenergic output, so may eventually trigger what are the ventricular arrhythmias leading to ventricular fibrillation. And that's what we have been knowing for years, and that's what is represented the background for the previous recommendation. And as Michael pointed out, there is complete agreement between the DA recommendation. European, American recommendation, a recommendation for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by American Heart Association, recommendation by, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by ESC. There are four documents that actually state the same. People with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should not participate in competitive sport, period. So why we are talking now about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Why? Because there is some, let's say, new, uh, relatively new evidence that may suggest a little bit different scenario. Uh, Michael already reminded you the study from Lampert. This is a study with people regularly engaged in regular physical activity and exercise and sports participation. This population, about more than 400 people, included people with hypertrophic and arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And as you know, there were, there were no deaths, which is the good things, but obviously there were shocks. If you look at the shocks that actually occurred during exercise, and this is what we are looking for, the vast majority of these shocks actually occurred in individuals with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, more than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so the authors conclude that arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy was the only disease, the only cardiomyopathy disease that was associated with a substantial increased risk during exercise which is what not true for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Well, uh, Michael already mentioned one short report that we published this year on circulation. We have been doing uh, further. We have collecting another subset of this uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy people playing regularly exercise and sports from another hospital in order to, let's say, address the bias of one center. And now we have 88 people, people with a definite diagnosis of hypertrophic, regularly engaged in sports at the time of diagnosis. We had a follow-up of seven years. After seven years of follow-up, there were still a subset, 27, that against the recommendation, against our medical advice, 
And uh, in the lack of medical eligibility clearance, which is needed in Italy, so how they did uh, is quite challenging. Well, they were still engaged in sports. And what about the events? Well, the events that we have two events in the people that stop regular exercise, and no events in the people that uh, were doing exercise. So, so but in summary, there were no differences in terms of events and symptoms because the population is relatively, let's say, small. We have no hundred, we have no thousand people. We have a small population. But you may understand that how it's difficult to collect this data. And so our data does not mean that every individual with hypertrophic can play sport. Our study, in, a, in agreement with the previous reports from Barry Meron, from Mitchell, from other people, suggest that within the broad spectrum of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, there are few, a subset of these individuals that are characterized. Number one, adult age. They are not young or adolescent. They are adult. Well, they have a very mild morphologic abnormalities, no left ventricular obstruction, almost normal diastolic and systolic feeling, uh, diastolic feeling and systolic function, uh, very low risk profile according to AC, which by evidence during the year, they have been playing sport because they didn't know they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what we have to do with this? It is reasonable that the recommendations are not going to change, but it is at the same time reasonable that we have not to state uh, no sport for everyone. We have to stay state, no sport for the vast majority of hypertrophic, but we may consider the possibility of, uh, let's say, allow competitive sports in very selected subset, in very selected minority, which are low risk profile, no symptoms, no history, family or personal history of the sudden death, no arrhythmias induced by exercise, a normal hemodynamic pattern during exercise, and so. In this case, it is totally obvious, as Michael told, that we have to inform very exhaustively the patient that the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does not exist zero risk. So they should be totally aware that they may have a residual risk. And in certain scenario, not in Italy, because we have a different guidelines, but in certain scenarios, such as here, where the cardiology is a consultant, or US, where the cardiology is a consultant, if the athlete is totally aware and well understood the risk, you may eventually just follow. Follow-up is obviously mandatory because uh, Usually, you may have symptoms preceding the death, and so you may catch the, you have the possibility to, to catch this, uh, to prevent the death. What about uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy? Here, the story is uh, quite different. I just want to report two more slides. This is uh, the retrospective investigation about 110 uh, people with a definite diagnosis of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which were evaluated according to the level of uh, physical activity and the sports participation. There were three groups, inactive, amateur, that is leisure time sports, and competitive athletes. And so here you see the black line shows the competitive athletes. The competitive athletes goes worsen. Worsen in terms of a clinical presentation of the disease, worsen in terms of probability and incidence of ventricular tachyarrhythmias. This is again competitive athletes versus recreational athletes. The probability of insurgence of symptoms and morphological alteration. But what is even relevant to us are the people that are phenotype negative but genotype positive. These individuals, they also show the same increased risk for progression of the disease, early manifestation of the morphologic abnormalities in the right ventricle, and particularly insurgence of the ominous ventricular arrhythmias if they are engaged in competitive sports. 
So at least goes worse than in any case. And from this evidence, the conclusion is obvious that in case of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, if you have a definite diagnosis, you should advise against participation in competitive sports. The same is true in people with the genotype positive and phenotype negative uh, pattern. What about leisure time physical activity? This could be different. The clear differentiation is between competitive sports, which is engagement in regular exercise training and competition, and only leisure time physical activity. The difference is in terms of number, intensity, and frequency of the sessions. And uh, what we can derive from the literature is that uh, leisure time physical activity at the very low level of intensity seems not to be different from to be inactive. So in other terms, does not convey an additional risk, which does not mean that those people have no risk. Those people, just because they have a disease, have a risk. But leisure time physical activity seems not to add an additional increased risk related to exercise. And this is it.